Today's episode is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash figure out your life with over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, and Kindle. Now let's get to the show. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back, folks. Welcome to Figure Out Your Life podcast, the place where we try to find the answers to life's everyday problems. I'm your host, Toya T, a.k.a. Toya T with the Ph.D. with both the dots, because <laughs> I realized that um, some people be putting the dots between the Ph and the D. And I was like, why am I doing that? So I changed it on my social media. It's something little, but it's ridiculous. Um, But it's, I mean, I don't think it really matters. But a.k.a. Toya T with the PhD, a.k.a. um, your sister from another mister, a.k.a. um, the girlfriend you didn't know that you needed, but you have, (laughs) a.k.a. um, the one that's going to go out and get the information for you uh, so you don't have to. Anyway, I'm running on. Uh, hey guys, welcome back. I'm so happy that you're here and back with me. It has been quite a week. I know I took last week off, but then again, I did put out two episodes in one week and uh, that was a lot of effort for me because I could barely get myself to record one uh, podcast and I have been meaning to batch up podcasts, but usually what happens is that I kind of like go off the fly. Like if something happens in my week, I usually just end up going with that as a podcast topic. And that's pretty much what's going on for this week. I was supposed to talk about um, living at home as an adult, but I think I'm going to do that for next week. But today is something different. But before I even get into that, I just wanted to um, kind of catch up with some stuff that has been in the news that I have been uh, paying attention to that has irked me. So let me just put this out here. And I, I'm only mentioning this TI thing because I was scrolling through Instagram this morning, like I usually do. And um, I saw that uh, Pods in Color, which is like a great place to find out about other podcasts of uh, by people of color. And she was talking about the whole T.I. thing and particularly about the podcast where he was being interviewed. So it's so funny that a lot of people keep talking about what T.I. said, but not as much about the podcast where he was interviewed and how the interviewers responded to it. So um, that shit was uh, interesting. So she went into it and was talking about like, yeah, what T.I. said was trash. Like he's creepy. Like I, I like his music, but like ever since he got on, um, family hustle and got that, that rebranding. Cause remember right before he did family hustle, TI's family hustle, whatever TI and tiny's family hustle. So before that TI was in prison for gun possession. Right. And he pretty much like his, like his, his whole career was on a halt because he, I think he went to prison for like a year. Don't quote me on that, but he was, he was away and it was pretty serious gun charges, pretty serious gun charges. And then he had a whole thing where him and tiny had like regular visits and she was giving him a hand job underneath the table. And then she kind of got like banned from being able to come see him or something like that. And then he got out on, I think probation and then fuck that up and had to go back in and then come back out. So he needed a whole rebranding. And um, so what he ended up doing was that he was luckily, he was lucky enough to be able to get this deal with VH1 to do a whole, um, to do a whole uh, reality show. And it was supposed to like help Pete, like help with his brand. Because at that time before he went in, he was like in movies, he was an American gangster. Um, He was like, you know, rising into like other, Uh, avenues of entertainment and the whole like gun charges and prison stint wasn't going to be good for his brand that he was trying to like build up, you know, with mainstream America. And so, um, he did a lot of like volunteer work and he was doing, he was doing speaking engagements with like, you know, youth and telling them what they should, you know, they shouldn't go down his same path, blah, 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 blah. But, um, he also got the family hustle and it's interesting that they use that kind of way of, uh, that kind of 
a reality show because it could have just been like following T.I. Instead, it's following his family. And like it, the whole branding thing was about showing him as like the modern day, um, the modern day Cliff Huxtable, which I mean, I mean, yeah, separate Cliff Huxtable from Bill Cosby. But um, yeah, you know, he was trying to be like America's dad and showing his whole quirky thing. All I got from it was that I, I like watching the kids. The kids are really cute. But um the kids are really cute, but what I got from it that is that T.I. is extremely, and I mean extremely, controlling. And, you know, the antics of the kids were funny. I, lo- I loved watching the kids because the kids were so bright, so funny. But, like, watching T.I. interact with Tiny, watching T.I., um, the kind of advice that he was giving his kids that he wasn't giving you know, like what he was giving to the girls and not to the boys was just, like, annoying. So I'm not surprised about what he said because he's always been a misogynist. Um, I was more surprised, like, uh, pause and color about the female that were interviewing him for this podcast. And the name of the podcast is, uh, ladies like us. Like, I'm just going to tell you what it is. Um, and, uh, pause and color pointed out that those ladies, one of them is Miguel's wife, fiance, whatever. I don't know, like whatever she is. And this other chick, cause I don't know these people. So, um, And they were like hyping up the whole thing that people were talking about their podcast. They were actually very happy that people were talking about their podcast. They were happy that T.I. came on and said this nonsense. And if you ever listen to the clip, even though um, you probably can get it from somebody who who downloaded it or recorded it, uh, because that's how I was able to listen to it, because I also uh, watched um, For Harriet uh, what is her name? Oh my gosh. Kim Foster. Is that what her name is? Whatever her name is. I watch her YouTube, um, channel and it's, uh, for Harriet. She has like the, um, online, uh, blog too, but she was talking, she had the, she had the recording, she recorded it and li- and showed it. And when he was talking his nonsense about like, yeah, I bring my daughter to the, to the doctors and I make sure that they check the hymen. And even though the doctor told me that the hymen can be broken through other ways, like I still tell him like, dude, like I'm paying you go, go find out what my results are. And they're laughing the entire time, which is like, why are you laughing? Like, I just can't imagine. Like, why are you laughing? Like, why are you laughing? I know he's a guest on your show, but like, it's your show. (laughs) It is your show. It is your show. And I found out through pods and color that both, um, their podcast and TI's podcast are both on podcast one network, which, you know, they get a lot of, um, you know, a lot of people, uh, marketing and pushing their, their podcast. And obviously they got TI because he's a part of the podcast one, um, the podcast one family. And so, uh, I feel like they wouldn't have been, there wouldn't have been any repercussions for them if they were just like, yo, dude, that's not cool. Like, are you serious? Like, are we joking here? Or are you serious? And, and even in that, it's not freaking funny, but, um, yeah, you're right, girl. They, uh, people, unfortunately, women are the biggest supporters of misogyny. <laughs> um, but yeah, women tend to be sometimes the biggest supporters of misogyny, but just like the response, like it wasn't even like, oh yeah, you know, I agree with you. Like you should be protecting your daughter. They were just laughing. And like, I know, like I like to laugh when I'm like uncomfortable. Um, and even when I just, I'm, I'm not uncomfortable. I just like to laugh, but like, it just was so disgusting. Like, it's just, you're grown ass women. Um, and I know that you probably wouldn't want your fathers to be talking about how they checked your hymen, uh, to make sure that your maidenhood, AKA your matinghood, your, your virginity, uh, was still intact, uh, and was bragging about it. But yet when talking about your brothers was like, I don't care. They can slang their dick ever wherever they want to. And I don't, I don't really, I'm concerned about their quote unquote virginity. Um, but I'm more concerned about yours. Uh, but I mean, maybe they did. Maybe they do have their fathers doing that. Maybe their fathers did that to me. I know that it could never happen in my household (laughs) because um, my mother would not play that shit. She would definitely not play that shit. And I could, I could never imagine my father even talking about my hymen or my vagina. Like, come on. And I've already talked about on this podcast, like I started having sex really early. I started having sex at, at 14. I lost my quote unquote virginity at 14. Although, um, as I'm hearing more people talking about this, uh, and talking about the fact that virginity in itself is a social construct, which I didn't even think about. And I'm a sociologist. I have taught 
all kinds of stuff. I've taught like, you know, social inequality. I have thoroughly talked about gender issues and are, I learned as I was teaching it. Um, and I've always talked about how sexuality in itself is like fluid and gender is a social construct, but I never even, you know, thought about the idea that virginity in itself is a social construct. I wish I was teaching right now because I would definitely bring that up as a subject matter. Like, you know, what the idea of virginity is because it varies from culture to culture, from person to person. Um, because all I was thinking about when I was listening to the audio of him saying like, you know, I want you to go check her hymen was that, okay. So if she knows that you're constant, you're going to be bringing her in to check her hymen. Um, and she know that she don't, as you say, quote unquote, she don't ride bikes. She don't play athletics. She don't do none of that stuff. Uh, so her hymen should be in check. Uh, most of those kids that know that their daddies are checking for quote unquote virginity, they end up doing all kinds of nasty stuff instead. I mean, I hate to call it nasty stuff. Am I talking about nasty stuff? Let me stop shaming people about their sexual preferences. So what usually ends up happening, especially like I'm talking about someone who, who grew up Catholic, not saying that I did this, but like, I know that, um, you know, within these circles, especially with, with Catholicism, where there's so much emphasis on virginity and purity, um, but particularly about the female vagina, <laughs> These girls go out and they're giving out blowjobs and they're taking it up the ass. I'm, I mean, like they're they're doing anal, and so it doesn't mean that she didn't have sex. It doesn't mean that she hasn't given a little boy blowjob. It doesn't mean that she, um, you know, wasn't taking it, wasn't doing anal sex, um, because you didn't ask the doctor to check for that, and you don't seem to be concerned about other ideas of sexuality or sex because you're not actually having a, a full on conversation with your daughter. And we all know that uh, Ti and Tiny are doing all kinds of butt stuff. Um, in the, in the privacy of their own homes with other people, with each other. Um, but it's just crazy that, that he thinks that it actually means anything. Like it brings any value. And what if he found out that her hymen was broken, but she never had sex or she did have sex. Like, what was he going to do? Disown her, but I'm getting off topic either way. Um, I like that they point that Plots and Collar pointed out that these ladies were so, so excited about the numbers they were getting, the fact that people were talking about this interview and only took it down. They deleted the episode. And at first, it turns out they tried to edit out his comments so they can keep the episode up. But that shit didn't work because obviously it just wouldn't flow. And people already heard it. So it's like, you know, and they were getting all these backlashes. So a whole bunch of people were giving them one stars and saying how disgusting it was, how they were disappointing in them. And then so after that, that's when they changed their tune and decided to put out a Instagram um or iOS uh, press release, <laughs> Instagram press release, social media press release and say, oh, we're so sorry. And, you know, we don't support that and blah, blah, blah. It's like, yes, you did. You supported it because you were just a few seconds, like a few like days before saying how happy you were that you had all these people talking about your podcast. So I just thought that was creepy as hell. T.I. is creepy. Um, he's a misogynist. He's a sexist. Um, he definitely is a male chauvinist. He's definitely somebody who is controlling, uh, it. And I, I find it also interesting that people aren't talking about on the, in the same interview that he actually said that his wife, tiny's vagina belongs to him. Like it's a part of marriage and she cannot deny him sex whenever he wants it. He's like, it's not about, you know, I'm not in the mood or it's a special occasion. He's like, yo, when you said I do your sex box is mine. It's half mine and I can do with it as I please. So if you tired, I don't care. If you're on your period, I don't care. If you uh, don't feel like it and not in the mood, I don't care. I'm going to take it when I want it. And um, that is just disgusting. And he's actually talking about marital rape, but no one seems to be talking about that part because the big thing is the story about um, him checking his daughter's hymen, which both, both parts of it is disgusting. So I just want to put that out there. And that was the big story. Um, but also how did I get into today's topic? So today's topic is about figuring out how to conquer fear of failure. Um, and so where this came from is that I recently put up a post. <laughs> I recently put up a post on Instagram and on my personal Facebook was talking about how I was, you know, I have all these, these accomplishments, but I, you know, I have a PhD, I have a master's, um, in sociology. I went to, um, you know, the oldest school in the nation and, and graduated with, you know, with honors from there. I went to an Ivy league school. Um, 
you know, I, I, I have all these accomplishments, but now I'm unemployed. Like I, I parted ways with my university of six years for various reasons. And I mentioned that in the podcast episode about figuring out, um, when to, um, keep what, you know, keep going with something and when to quit. Um, and I had to quit. It was the best thing I could have done for myself. Like, look at my skin. <laughs> for those who are watching um, on, on on the Instagram live, or those who just follow me, uh, I mean, like, literally, look at my skin. My skin is glowing, glowing. You know why? Because I ain't stressed. Um, but even though I'm not stressed, I do have a lot of fear because I'm unemployed. I haven't been unemployed for six years, um, and even before that, I wasn't really unemployed because I was in graduate school, and so for me, it was just like this scary moment where I just didn't know what I was doing in my life because I literally went from high school into college, went from college right into graduate school. So there was a plan. <laughs> and then, you know, graduate school, going into a PhD program, there is a set, you know, pathway that you are going to go into the, into the academy. You're going to be going on the tenure track, um, you know, trying to get a tenure track job. Uh, and do research and teach and all this other stuff. And, um, you know, that's the pathway that they push for everybody, even though there's not enough jobs for everybody. Just point that out there because uh, graduate school, like all schools are businesses, um, unfortunately. (laughs) And so uh, I realized that that wasn't working for me, but yet, you know, I still had a goal. I had still had something to do. So once I figured out I didn't want to go into a tenure track job, I still needed to finish my, my PhD. And so that was something I was doing, but then right when I finished, I was working. So I was teaching and, um, all up until this year. And so I had something to do with myself all this time. And even though, uh, during those six years, I was trying to find a new job, uh, because I could not work part-time. I was an adjunct for way too long. A girlfriend needed benefits. I needed my mama to stop telling me how much I needed benefits. I even came up with a new word, for a job with benefits. I call it a J-O-B-B, <laughs> a J-O-B-B, because it got two Bs, a job with benefits, because I had a job, I had a J-O-B, but I didn't have a J-O-B-B. <laughs> um, the double B, I didn't have the benefits. And then, you know, for one semester, they gave me that. And I was like, look at my paycheck. It looks so nice. And I don't got to pay the, you know, I don't have to pay out of pocket uh, for my own, um, you know, state sponsored insurance. Yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, and then they snatched that shit away. Just like snatched it. They promised that it would it would continue and they snatched it and then gave me the same old song and dance. Uh, and that is when I when I broke. That's when I uh, wanted to quit and it took a year. But <laughs> I eventually was like, I can't go back to this. Like they're not changing. Um, and like, I'm a grown ass woman. I'm 36. I would like to buy a house. I don't plan to be living in my mama's house forever, even though she thinks... That's what the plan is. And I think that's also a part of the fear that was coming up for me is that, um, you know, I have all these accomplishments, but now I'm unemployed. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm taking this time to figure out what I'm doing. But I was scared. Last week, I was really scared. And that post came out of real fear. That morning, I was, I, I, I was just feeling defeated. I was feeling lost. I was feeling like, what the fuck am I going to do? Like, it's almost the end of the year. It's almost 2020. Um, like my mom likes to joke about how she, you know, I, you know, about like, she gonna kick me out, (laughs) but she ain't gonna kick me out. But, um, which is a blessing, which is one thing that I will, I will put out there. It's a blessing to be able to have a roof over my head and food, you know, in the, in the fridge, even when I I don't go grocery shopping, there's still food. (laughs) But, um, it was just scary to kind of, I, it was scary to kind of think of like, not living up to my potential because I've always been a high achiever. And even though I have experienced some failures and I love to tell my students that, especially when I would check in with them because I would check in with everybody and tell them like, you know, failing is not an embarrassment. It's about what you're going to do about it. Because uh, I will tell you right now, I only failed one class in my whole life and I still have nightmares about it. One class in my whole life. And because I was so scared by the failure in itself, like so scared. And I failed because I was overworking myself. It was my uh, first semester of senior year. I knew I was applying to graduate school. 
I was the president of two clubs. I was the president of the Caribbean Students Association. I was also the um, president of the um, Columbia University STEP team. So I was running both of those things. And then also I was applying to graduate school. Also, I knew that my fam- like my family was going to um, to Dominica for Christmas. So I knew that I had like, I had to also prepare myself to travel by the end of the semester. Um, and then also... I was working in the admissions office. I had two part-time jobs. I was working in the admissions office. I was also working as a teaching assistant for one of my very favorite professors, Dr. Carl Hart. Um, And I just previously, the the year before, had taken his class and then asked him to be my um, college mentor and, you know, hooked me up with this, like, sweet job. Uh, But that meant I had to go to class. I had to go to the – I had to go to every single class, which – when you have your own class schedule and you have one more class you have to go to on top of your class schedule, because I was trying to double major. So I was trying to, I was already a psych major. And then I, I decided pretty late that I wanted to add on a sociology concentration. And so I had a lot of like required classes to take. And, um, I was, I was trying to get those required classes done so I could get the concentration uh, but then I also had to go to this extra class. I also wanted to take classes that I knew that I wouldn't be able to take once I left college. And so I was taking tap and ballet. Um, I think I was taking three dance classes. I was taking tap, ballet, and maybe African dance, but I don't think, I think I took African dance the next one. But I was taking tap and ballet because I always wanted to take ballet and ballet was kicking my fucking ass. And that shit was at eight o'clock in the morning. Um, and, and I was also taking like five classes and then also had that one class that I had to attend, uh, which the class that I had right after my TA class was the class that I started skipping. And that's the class that I failed. And it also happened to be a required class for my sociology concentration. And so because I wasn't going to class, as I would tell my students, I failed. And I, so I tell them like, you have to show up, like you can't not show up for class because when I, as a high achiever, didn't go to class and thought that I could like, you know, somehow pass the class, I failed because I got none of the information, no information because I didn't go to class. Um, and I failed and I was so overwhelmed. Like I had a, like, that was the first time that I'd ever experienced an anxiety attack. Like I was in the, I was in the library, I remember. And I had, you know, my graduate school applications that I had to get done. I had a research paper that I needed to get done for, uh, I was also in two fellowship programs. I forgot to mention that I was in the Mellon Mays, um, undergraduate fellowship program and also the McNair, um, um, fellowship program. Both of them are aimed at getting, um, uh, students of color and people from underrepresented backgrounds, um, or low income backgrounds too, uh, into, uh, the academy to go into graduate school and then eventually become, um, professors. And so I had both of these programs, you know, like on me because I was the only person that expressed that I wanted to go straight through and they needed the numbers of someone who was applying to graduate school and going. And so I had all this pressure and I think I just mentioned all of it. That was a lot. Like I, I can't even remember. There was probably even more. And I was trying to like, you know, senior year, I was trying to like, you know, be, you know, I was trying to be social, trying to go to the parties, you know, trying to get me some, <laughs> like all kinds of stuff. And it just was not working. I wasn't sleeping. I wasn't eating well. I had a, they had that anxiety attack. I thought I was having a heart attack. Like I just felt my heart just like, I felt like I was going to pass out. Um, and so I dropped the ball. I dropped the ball and ended up failing that class. And I was so embarrassed by it that I didn't even say anything until it was too late. So it was like the next semester. And I, was, I went to my advisor and asked like, you know, is there, is there some way that I can uh, get this credit? Because that's the only credit I need to get a sociology concentration. And he was like, nope, we only give that class once a semester. And if you'd come to me earlier, maybe we could have figured out something where you could have taken the class at another school or over the winter break. But because you didn't, um, you're just going to have to graduate with a psychology degree and, um, with a psychology degree and, you know, a bunch of sociology classes. And I was like, what the fuck? Uh, but, um, that all came because one, I was afraid of failure Two, I failed, um, and didn't know how to deal with it, but that is the whole point. So I, I'm saying is that when I started, uh, thinking about, you know, what am I going to do with myself? I started to feel like kind of like real serious, like just, feeling of, you know, disappointment of, you know, possible failure of fear of 
the unknown. What am I going to do next? How am I going to, you know, push through this? And um, I expressed that to my friends and I'm happy that I did because they really helped me kind of focus on what it is. Like it's fear. Fear is always going to be there. You're never going to be unafraid. You have to kind of push through it. And I was like, that is so powerful. So I wrote about it. It took me a long time to put that post together and tell people like, you know, you see this pretty picture. And I had posted a picture of my newest headshots um, uh, for um, for LinkedIn. You see me doing like seemingly doing well, but um, inside I'm I'm fearful. I don't know what I don't know what I'm doing, and so I put that out there, and I got so much love from people. I just <laughs> I didn't even really expect it. Like within the first thirty minutes, I had like sixty um, likes and comments. Like people were just coming in and just being encouraging. I had people who called me. Um, shout out to Sadale for sending me a text and like, you know, being supportive. <laughs> shout out to my friend Jamoki for actually, you know, calling me the next day. Like people were like really reaching out. Um, shout out to um, Jamel, uh, who sent me a message all the way from Liberia <laughs> and was like, yo, what can we do? Like, have you thought about, you know, looking into this? And um, and I just I'm, I'm really appreciative of of people reaching out to me and showing me support and telling me that they're rooting for me and telling me I've accomplished a lot and just kind of really just lifting me up. And so, um, I'm happy that I put that out there, but again, it was like a lot of fear of like, Oh my gosh, people are going to see that I am not doing well. Like people are going to see that I, um, even with all these accolades and accomplishments, um, still feel like I'm failing. Like I'm like, I'm disappointing someone. And I'm particularly concerned about disappointing my parents, mainly for the fact that I, have an immigrant background. Um, and I grew up in a single parent household and I just think about all the sacrifices that my mom went through, uh, when she was, you know, younger than me. Um, and, and when she was my age and how she was able to make it through, I mean, by, by the time she was my age, she had two kids she was raising by herself. She was working full time and somehow, you know, made it to a place where, um, not even somehow through hard work because my mother is a hard fucking worker and she's very intelligent um uh through hard work was able to like go from someone who was working part-time in college uh at this at this company and was able to go up to you know executive levels i mean shit i want to be my mama when i grow up okay i want to be you know this she's given me such a great example as someone who came from another country um, pretty much was the first one of her family to show up here, uh, to migrate here was the, um, was the, you know, the, um, the hub for her siblings that came up here. Almost all of her, I think every single one of her siblings that have moved to the United States from Dominica lived with my mother at one point in time, including my grandmother, including my cousins, all of them, everyone has lived with my mother, everyone. And I was there for, um, most of them. Some I can remember, some I cannot. Actually, I was, yeah, I was, yeah, yeah. I was there for all of them. It's just that I was a child when some, when most of them started. And to see how well she's doing, I mean, my mother makes six figures, okay? She a boss. She ain't even here right now. She on vacation for two weeks. Lady just left, <laughs> left. She's like, I ain't got no babies. I'm, I'm out of here. Go to the Caribbean. Then want to send me a picture talking about looking at my mosquito bites. Bitch, I am freezing, <laughs> I am freezing. And you sit and talk about, look at my mosquito bites. I wish I was dealing with mosquito bites because that would mean that it was warm. But, you know, she a boss. She got two cars. She, you know, she driving, driving an Audi, you know, has her own house, makes six figures. Like you got people reporting to her. She got, you know, she firing people. She giving people promotions. She constantly points out how she, you know, she pays more. Um, she pays more in taxes than I make in a year. I'm like, go ahead, girlfriend, go ahead. Uh, and so knowing all this, I just feel like, you know, I don't want to disappoint her. I actually went to therapy to deal with my fear of failure. I had like a whole therapist telling me like, why are you so, so concerned about, you know, you know, failing and, and disappointing your mother? And I had to like dig deep into it. And so some of that, you know, I, some of that is still creeping through, but I'm so happy that I spoke to my friends because they really helped me to go to actually process it and see what is it that actually am I feeling? And so what happened here was that I decided that this would be a great topic. And so many people responded like, and are still responding to this post that I made about 
my uh, about my fear and dealing with fear and learning how to push through fear and how to use that fear, I thought that it would be a great topic to, to talk about on the podcast. So, of course, I looked up some stuff, <laughs> like I always do. And um, so here it is. So fear of fear failure. What is it? So um, I, I found like a couple a couple articles. And so I'm just going to go through some of the stuff that I found from it. So they talk about fear failure is a significant obstacle that stands between you and your goals. It's human nature to have a fear of failure. And that is true. Like both of these things I realize are things that we have to experience. You have to experience fear in order to know your boundaries, in order to keep yourself safe. I mean, that is, you know, with children, you know, they learn, they, they, they develop a fear of things, um, as they experience, experience them. And so if you tell them not to, you know, not to, to run up the stairs and they continue to run up the stairs and they don't understand why you tell them don't run up the stairs. They don't understand it until they, you know, bust their ass on the stairs. And then they're like, Oh shoot. Like that is why my mama told me not to run on the stairs because you know, I'm, I could hurt myself. And so they gain that fear of like, okay, maybe I won't run up the stairs anymore or I'll hold on to the railing because now I know I'm afraid of being hurt like that again, right? Experiencing that pain. And it's the same thing. Like, you know, it's an, it's something that we can't even control because we know that it is a psychological, um, and a physiological response of like, you know, um, you know, uh, fight or flight. And so the flight or flight instinct is like you see something and you're either going to stand and fight it or you're going to run and save yourself because you are fearful of it and sometimes when you if you stand and fight um you learn something from it either you learn that you can conquer this fear this thing that 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 scares you that is that is this obstacle that's in your way or you learn that this is something that you need to avoid or you know approach differently and um as a part of that Feel, failure is also something that you have to experience too, because, um, you have to, you, you learn from failure. You can't do things and only expect success because it's when you actually experience failure is that that's when you start to be able to grow, to reevaluate what you're doing, what's working, what's not working and how can I do better? Right. And so, and they tend to be linked together because people are, as I said, like me, afraid of failure. And so, um, and then you may do something and then you fail and then you become afraid of failing again. And so it goes, it's intertwined and it kind of goes in a, in a, um, in a, in a circle, but that kind of feeds itself. Like they feed each other. But I think people have more problems when they try to avoid fear and failure. Um, because they're not really experiencing life. They're not really growing when you act based off of trying to avoid something that's inevitable, something that you, that will happen um, because that's life. Like you have to, like it happens, like you will experience, you know, instances where you don't win, where you don't accomplish something. And it's about what do you do after that? Um, And that's why when people who don't experience like setbacks or no often turn out to be like the most awful people ever. I'm thinking about the orange orangutan that's in the freaking White House. Like he has failed many times, but I, but he's never received any repercussions for his failures. He's bankrupt himself more than once. He's bankrupt businesses. Um, Businesses have failed, but he has never had to experience um, that failure because he's been bailed out either by his daddy or bailed out by being able to file bankruptcy and not have to pay his debtors and then just keep going. I mean, even now for his bad behavior, he says things and nothing has happened to him. And it's when repercussions start to happen that he actually does something. He starts reacting in ways that he doesn't know what to do. He starts acting out because he's never had to be punished for his, um, for his actions which 
you know, makes sense because he hasn't, he hasn't experienced it. He doesn't know how to deal with failure. He has failed, but he doesn't know how to deal with failure because he doesn't have, he doesn't have any fear of it, which is good because, you know, it pushed, has pushed him in ways um, that people could never imagine, never imagine someone who was a failed business person um, and pretty much a reality TV star. And then decides like, you know what, I'm going to run for president. Um, It's that lack of feel of failure fear failure that has that propelled him to take such a large leap but it also has perpetuated his bad behavior because he doesn't know how to act when things don't go his way so it is very much human nature to have a fear of failure but fear failure is something that we have to experience I mean what it feels like it's that it's just this intense worry that you experience when you imagine that all the horrible things that could happen if you fail to achieve a goal, which is what I've been going through was like, oh my gosh, like if I do not get a new job or figure out what the fuck I'm doing with my life, like I'm just going to be living with my mama for the rest of my life. I'm going to be single. I'm not even going to be having no cats because I can't have no cats because my mama don't like cats because I'll be living with my mama um, and I'm allergic to them and I can't even have a dog. Like you know, these dogs are, are loyal and love you. Um, but but she won't want me to have a dog either. And so I'd have to move out to be able to do so, but I won't be able to do so because I'm a failure and I won't have a job and I will, you know, just slowly shrivel up into a ball and just, you know, become a raisin. <laughs> uh, and some of that comes from the fact that she keeps saying like, well, you just think you could just stay here all your life. Like my, my two kids just don't leave. And I was like, lady, if you think that I ain't trying to get the fuck out of here, you must be out your mind. Like I may not be paying you rent, but I am definitely uh, paying off my debts and saving my ducats. Like all I need right now really is like a uh, steady stream streams of income. I just need some steady streams of income to be able to get to to be able to get you know approved for a loan so I can get my ass a house and get the fuck out of here so I can do whatever the fuck I want okay Uh, I definitely do not want to be living with you my whole life that is not the goal the goal was never even to come back um which for me feeds into that that idea of failure because I when I went off to college I was like I ain't never come back to Boston I don't want I have no interest in living here and here I am You know, I moved back home because I didn't have anything set up after I finished my dissertation fellowship at um, UC Santa Barbara. And I needed some place where I could finish my my dissertation and get my get my Ph.D. And coming back home was just like, oh, it was just supposed to be temporary. And then I look around and I'm still fucking here and you just have to deal with it. It happens. Like that's what my friends told me. Uh, Shout out to Aisha Madison. Thanks. Thanks for the pep talk from my. Uh, brown girl therapy group chat and don't nobody take that because uh that's mine (laughs) i'm about to come up with something for that um but it happens when we go outside of our comfort zones we feel scared (sighs) and that is the whole point of the fear the fear actually lets us know where our boundaries are for our comfort zone um and it's the intense worry that we have that increases the odds of holding us back and increases the chances of us giving up on our goals, giving up on our dreams, because we don't want to step outside of our comfort zone. And um, another thing is that some of it comes from the fact that our identities, our self identities, our self confidence can be, can be so wrapped up in what we are doing. Like I said, like I started off the post that I put out with saying like, you know, I'm going to make myself women cr- woman crush Wednesday because I need to, I needed to boost myself up. I needed to, I need to praise myself to push through, you know, this, this feeling of, of potentially failing of this fear of failure. And so I, um, you know, pointed out that, you know, I wanted to big up myself, you know, Dr. Latoya Chantel Tavernier PhD. <laughs> and I did that and I put all those titles out there. And I put it out there because it's a part of my identity. But then also when I'm, you know, researching this, realizing that these things, these titles that I hold, that my identity is very much wrapped into them in what I'm doing. And the fact that I have these titles and they're associated with a certain profession. So I should be doing something with teaching or research. And I have these titles and I put these titles out there and I'm unemployed. It's like, you know, I'm not doing anything. And so I feel like I'm nothing because I'm not doing anything. I'm not doing what people are expecting me to do or what I, or what my parents expect me to do or what I expect myself, um, to be doing at this time. And that 
when things don't go as we expect, right? We can feel like we are failing at life. That's usually how it feels for me. Like, oh my gosh, I am failing at life. That's what I felt. That's that's actually the best way to put it. That that feeling that I had last Wednesday, I felt like I was failing at life. Like failing at life. And I actually had to, before I even put up the post, right? Because I had that conversation. I had that feeling in the morning. Um, I went for a walk, I think. And then... Um, no, I went for a run. I went for a run at the gym, came back and just still felt shitty. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, told my friends on the group chat and they really helped me, you know, figure out that it's fear. It's fear. You got, everyone has fear. It'll always be there. And you just have to work with the fear. You got to work through the fear. You got to push through the fear because fear will be there. And if you feel like you don't know what to do, you just sit down and make a plan, sit down and refocus on something else. And, um, for me, that's what that's what helped me kind of get through it is that I had to start thinking about like what have I actually not failed at that day? Like not in life, but what have I not failed at that day? It's like, oh, I went to the gym. <laughs> I had a goal to go to the gym, I went to the gym. I made my bed. I um I I reorganized my closet. Look at look at those things. Those are small victories. Um, just to help me get out of this feeling that I was failing at life. Like <laughs> Like, how are you failing at life, but you alive? Like, it's it's crazy, right? Because, like, failing at life would mean that you're not alive. Like, you failed at living, and so you would be dead. And um, I'm not. So it's it's kind of really ridiculous. So <sighs> continuing on this. So within these articles that I found, of course, they have tips. And this is, I mean, this is what I'm what I'm leading to is trying to give you guys tips. Cause I found out that other people felt the same way that I felt that they were supporting me, that they understood that I wasn't alone, that I wasn't this big failure that they were laughing at, you know, in private and possibly in my face or, or behind my back. Um, that it is something that is natural and something they understood. And so how can we learn to use failure to our advantage? That is the question that I'm trying to get the answers to for you guys. Um, rather than sitting there and fearing it, instead of fearing the failure, how can we use it to our advantage? How can we use this fear of failure? And so here are some strategies that I found to help you move through your failure. And I'm going to be using this just like Beyonce said in bigger. Um, what did she say? She said, um, I'm not just preaching it. Um, taking my own advice. And she's like, you got, you bought us something way bigger. And so that's what I'm doing. Also, don't mind my singing. Okay. I'm not a singer. That is not my day job. I don't have the PhD in singing. <laughs> so here are some, I think I have, I have five, I have five strategies. So here we go. Strategy number one, redefine failure and reframe your goals. So what does that look like? Success is often hard to define. You know, people find a hard way to define what exactly success looks like. Interesting thing is, is that failure is even harder to define because we all have different examples of what success and failure are. It is hard to define success and failure unless we actually have a definition for ourselves. You actually have to make a definition that makes sense. So, uh, we have to start thinking about what is our definition of failure? Is it given up? Because if I put, if I define failure as giving up, not doing anything, being stagnant, being still, just, you know, deciding to just live in my mama house forever and just not do anything. Is that failure? Is that what I see as failure? Yes. I can say that. I can say giving up is failure, but I haven't given up. Even when, when I felt so shitty and I had been feeling shitty for like maybe a couple weeks, right? Just like uh, unsure, but I haven't given up. I haven't stopped being productive. I mean, people ask me when I see them like, oh, like you no longer work, but you're working. Oh my gosh. Like, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, I'm working on my podcast. I'm trying to build my brand my podcast following and build my podcast brand. And that is doing something. It may not be doing exactly, you know, it may not be connected to what I left. And is usually the expectation that if you leave something that you automatically have something set up, you know, to replace it. And I don't have that. And so 
I was taking that as a definition of failure. But then when I start thinking about the things that I do in the day, so it's like, okay, I no longer, I'm not working right now, but what are you doing? Are you sitting around doing nothing? No, I'm not. I haven't given up on being productive. I haven't given up on being social. I haven't given up on looking for the next chapter in my, in my journey, the next chapter in my life, my life story, working on that. Like I'm here right now recording with you, recording and, you know, trying to build it. And so build myself, build up a, a, you know, a different part of myself and exploring that. And so if I use that as example of me not giving up, then I guess I'm not failing. I guess that I can't say that I'm failing. I can't say that I'm a failure. Um, is it, if you're, so the thing about this definition of failure, is it never going after your goals? Well, um, I can say for myself, no, I can't say that I, 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 I'm, I, that I have stopped giving up on my goals. I work on goals every day. I work on projects every day. I still have a dream of being, you know, having, um, you know, a career that fits all of my passions. I actually wrote this down when I was at a a conference. I was at a, I was at the African-American women in higher education conference, um, like two weeks ago. And, uh, when I was there, I had my passion planner with me, shout out to passion planner, (laughs) love my passion planner. And I was writing in it, like, what do, what do I want? What do I, what kind of titles? What if I, if I, when I die, what do I want people to, to remember me as? Cause they were talking about legacies. And I was like, you know, during this conference, like it was one of the keynote speakers talking about legacies. Like, what do you want people to say about you when you're gone, when you're no longer around? And I'm like, oh, okay, what do I want? I want to be known as a educator because I love teaching. I love helping people, um, you know, learn something they didn't know, be less ignorant. I I love just reading and, and knowledge in general. Um, I want to also be a public speaker because I think that that's the best avenue. I'm a storyteller and I feel like storytelling through public speaking and helping others through my story and, you know, just telling the straight unadulterated truth is helpful. And that's something that I'm trying to work into getting into, although I don't know how to, but I'm trying to work my way into getting into that, but that's a part of the plan. So that's two things I want to be, um, I want to be known as a podcast host. I love this podcast. I love doing it, even though, even though I have to push myself to like, oh my gosh, girl, we gotta get done. But um, once I get into it, I love it. I love it. I love engaging with people. I love engaging with listeners, like people reaching out to me and saying like, I love your podcast. Like, I think it's so funny. Like, I really love the information that you give. Like, it's not like a lecture. It's like interesting. And I'm like, that's how I teach. That's, you know, that's how I, that's how I run my life. That's, that's, you know, that's how I do things. So I want to be a podcast host. I was a podcast host. Number three, uh, number four, I want to be known as an influencer, like, and not in like a, like, Hey guys, like check out my, you know, I'm working with this brand and like, you need to like really use this. And even though I don't use it, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to sell you flat tummy tea, even though if flat tummy tea wants to sponsor this podcast, I would be, I would be talking about some flat tummy tea. Okay. But you know, I, I don't see that being a part of my brand because I ain't drinking no flat tummy tea. So, um, but I want to be an influencer as in like using, my influence to help others. So people knowing me as someone that they can reach out to, like I, I say in the beginning, I'm the, I'm the best friend or the girlfriend that you didn't know that you needed, but you have. And so like, I like that idea. Like I love telling people about things that I, that I've found out about and then, you know, helping them, you know, through my influence. <laughs> I also want to be an online personality. Like I put that on there. It's funny. I have a YouTube channel. Um, I don't <laughs> post on it as much as I should. <laughs> as much as not even a should, as much as I'd want to, as much as I tell myself that I, that I need to, I don't post on it as often, but like I have over 2000 followers. <laughs> I have, you know, I have videos with over a million views. Um, and I have also seen how some people have used the online platform, YouTube, um, online personalities into bigger things, things that I feel like, you know, I can do. I can do and I have a special brand on it. Like I have a special spin to it. I have something that I add to the online world. Like that's how people are getting out there. 
I, I, I would love to be featured on Good Morning America, but I don't want to be a Good Morning America host. You know, I, I want to be able to use my platform and use my words to be able to reach people and to be known as someone that is not, you know, a writer or an author, but like, Uh, an online personality, like someone who's, you see like a visual storyteller. So I guess that's a part of all of that. And so these are all goals that I know that I've, that I want to achieve and I haven't given up on it. So I guess that's, uh, that makes, I guess I'm not a failure in that way. Um, is my definition going back to definitions is my definition, not achieving the desired outcome. Now that might be what my definition of failure is like, not, achieving my desired outcome. My desired outcome of leaving my job was that, or separating myself from my job would be that, or, or attempting to that somehow they would be like, Oh my gosh, you're so amazing. Don't leave. Don't, don't you don't go heck. Here is a job. Here is a, the perfect salary, um, and the benefits and please come back. We love you. And we're just going to do anything we can to, um, get you to stay and be happy. That didn't happen. So I think that is probably part of my feeling of failure that I didn't have something completely lined up right after that. I didn't have like a better job to be like, shut it, you know, like, fuck you. I'm going over here, but I don't need this. I got another job, but that might be it. Like, you're not achieving the desired outcome, but what does that mean? You know, like don't sometimes like people's dreams and outcomes like change like your desired outcome. And I guess I have to kind of deal with that, but I think that's probably what my definition is not achieving the desired outcome. Um, other things that, uh, that also, uh, you should think about when you're, when you're talking about your definition of failure, um, not achieving the desired outcome within an expected timeline. So you have a desired outcome, but you eventually reach it, but it wasn't within your timeline. So for example, Um, I had the, um, my desired outcome when I went to graduate school was that I was going to get my PhD in five years, five years. I was going to, I came in at 2005 and I was going to come out at 2010, like graduate in 2010. That was, that was the plan. Now that didn't happen. (laughs) Do I have a PhD? Yes. We all know that I have a PhD. I got the PhD, but when did I, when did I graduate? 2015. That was not the expected timeline. And a part of the fact that, that, that I had not finished by 2010 added to my whole depression and feeling of failure and all this other stuff that really held me up and kind of pushed my timeline even further because I had to deal with these mental health issues that were tied to this uh, desired outcome with an expected timeline um, issue. And I think that's also something that I have to deal with because I I also use that as a definition of failure that um, I didn't achieve something, my desired outcome, and I didn't achieve it. I I, I did achieve it, but not in the expected timeline that I have. And so that is something that I know that I use um, for failure, but uh, it is important to understand that so that you can actually read, like redefine it and reframe your goals. So you know, we have to be clear. It's very important to be clear about what you consider failure since failure is the object of your fear and the obstacle to your success. So now that I know, so I've just identified for myself. So let me just repeat it to you um, again. So things that you have to think about, what is your definition of failure? Is it giving up? Is it never going after your goals? Is it not achieving the desired outcome or is it not achieving the desired outcome within an expected timeline? So we've already uh, established that for me, It is the last two, not achieving my desired outcome and not achieving the desired outcome within an expected timeline. I think for me, what my problem is, is that I have an expected timeline. Like by 2020, I need to be working January 1st, working. Um, And when that doesn't happen, you know, that's when I start feeling bad. So that is an obstacle to my success because I'm focusing so much on the fear of the failure that I'm not moving forward. I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And I think you know, lots of people get caught up in that. So where do you go from there? You start to reframe failure by shifting your goals. So, you know, some goals require focus and persistence. Uh, Other uh, goals require openness and flexibility, like being able to say like, well, it didn't happen in this time. I'm just going to shift to this. I'm going to focus on this. I'm going to, you know, be open to seeing where things go from here. So being able to reevaluate and redefine the outcome you hope to achieve is a good buffer against the 
fear of failure. So being able to use that to expand your goals to include other acts. So for example, expand your goal to include learning something new. Oh, I learned something new today through this action. And so if you use that as your goal, you will technically never fail because there's always something you can be that can be learned. There's always something to be learned. So that like, you know, focusing on that, that is a good way to kind of deal with your fear of failure. And that's what I'm going to use because mama's trying to take her own advice. So number two, uh, visualize your obstacles. So fear is our response to two kinds of threats, real and imagined. The things that we know is real, like the snake in front of you is real. (laughs) The snake in front of you is real. People talking about how you are a failure is probably imagined. And so we need to know the difference. We really know the difference. Like we know what's real. We know what real threats are. They pose a threat to our survival. The snake will bite me. If I see the snake, the snake will bite me if I fuck with it. Okay. Um, If it's there, it's possibly going to bite me. But imagine threats are hypothetical scenarios. Research has shown that the best outcomes are created when we balance positive thinking with visualizing the future obstacles and struggles we will encounter. And so we actually have to visualize the obstacles, the possible obstacles. I know the possible obstacle about getting a J-O-B-B is that I'm going to send out tons and tons and tons of applications, which like, which I was doing when I was working and I'm probably not going to get an interview that you can send out a hundred applications and only get three interviews. It is something that happens. It's an obstacle, but it's good to know that it's there ahead of time. And, and the fact that research actually shows that you work better when you know what the obstacles are, because you are better able to visualize how to, how to move through them. So I know that I'm going to send something to this school that I really would love to work at, but I'm probably not going to get something back. I'm probably not going to get a call back or an interview and that's okay that you just keep, you just keep applying. (laughs) You just keep applying until someone calls you in. And so that is, they say, is the best way to deal with things. Allow yourself to feel the fear of being rejected and failing. And then you see yourself moving forward. Next, sit down and think about how do I get through? And so, like I said, like what happened to me last week, I sat down and I actually really thought about like, what are all the things that you have done today? Because you, if you think that you're a failure at life, you would be doing nothing. And that's if you if you define failure that way. And if you can concentrate on all the things that you have accomplished today, that might make you feel better because you're not, you have, you have small victories. You had a goal and you accomplished it. And being able to see yourself succeeding despite these obstacles is the best way to be able to deal with that fear of failure. So visualize those obstacles figure out how you're going to, how you would deal with them and then see yourself succeeding at it. And then you will be able to push yourself through that. Number three, uncover your story. When we take failure very personally, we always, always associate the failure with a bigger story about ourselves. We are taking the failure to mean that I'm not good enough. Like you, you, like you ever seen those memes on, on Instagram or social media when they're like, I am good enough. I am good enough. Um, and the reason why those memes always do so well and they're all over the place is because it is, it is a common feeling when people start thinking about failure and have a fear of failure that they're not good enough. Like I told you about the the whole fear that I felt last week about like my career prospects. It is the fear that I am not good enough. Like maybe someplace else does not want me. Maybe I am in this situation because I don't have the skills or the focus or the energy or the capacity to be able to do better. And to really fully understand the fear of failure, uh, we have to identify the consequences, the consequences, the real consequences, not the imagined, but the real consequences of failing that scare us the most and evaluate what our abilities are to deal with these consequences. And so instead of talking yourself out of the fear by hoping that nothing negative would happen. So, oh no, nothing's going to happen. Like, you know, like I'm going to get it. Like it's gonna, I'm going to always succeed. Everything I do is going to be great. And I'm always, you know, going to see, you know, um, that my desired outcomes. And so I'm not afraid of the failure and I'm, I'm not going to feel that negative feeling. We need to focus on building confidence to deal with the consequences. And so thinking about it, once you uncover the story behind, like what is the story that you've created in your head about the failure, like the consequences of your failure? Once you've uncovered that story, you notice that it's just that a story. Like I said, it's imagined it's something that you just came up in your head and you see if you can rewrite it by creating a more positive response, such as I'm willing to take risks and I learn from my mistakes and move on. Let me say that again. So you come up with a response 
that says, I'm willing to take risks and I learn from my mistakes and move on. Number four, they said, ask yourself three powerful questions when you're dealing with your fear of failure. So they say to ask yourself, what did I learn from this situation? Because you can learn from everything. Again, if you reframe your ideas about failure and success and make it into like, um, did I learn something and make that a goal? Like I learned something new today. Then you can, when you ask yourself that question, it helps you feel belt, you know, be able to push through that fail, that fear of failure um, and realize that even if you do fail, you can learn from your situation and move forward. Number two, the question that you need to ask, how can I grow as a person from this experience? So focus on how can I grow? How can I learn something about myself? How can I develop better skills? If this is not working, um, what can I do to, to make it work? What can I do to improve? What can I do to reach my new desired outcome? Number three, what are three positive things about this situation? So you can always find like three is my favorite number. So I just love that it's three, three questions and three. The last one talks about find three th- positive things about this situation. Three positive things about my situation is um, I was able to spend more time working on my podcast. Uh, number two, I know more about myself. So I know about that. I have different interests. I have that I want to be known, not just as an educator or a professor or teacher that I want to have different um, titles and positions that people associate with me. And that is fine. And that is great. And that I can work on all those things and some more than, than others at the same time. Uh, Number three is that a positive thing that came from my situation is that um, I have more time to focus on my health. As I said, my skin popping. Okay. My skin looking clearer. (laughs) Um, I just feel like I'm, I'm in a healthier place because I'm not as stressed. Like I, I somehow, I don't know if it's daylight savings, but I, I am up early. Okay. I'm up early. I'm usually asleep by like nine, 10 o'clock. Like I got someplace to go, but I'm getting eight hours of sleep and I'm happy that I'm in a space where I feel like that I am giving to myself. I'm getting to know myself. I'm listening to myself and I, I am definitely in a happier, more stress, less place. I can still have my fear of failure, but that is not like, that's human nature. As I just talked about, as my friends pointed out, it's human nature. It's part of life. You just have to push through it, but I'm good. Like when people were reaching out to me, I was like, I hope I didn't make it seem like I was destitute. Like, I'm just telling you like how I'm feeling, but I'm good. There's a roof over my head. I'm good. I'm not living in my car. And that is a real, that is a real life consequence for people who are, who end up being part-time or adjunct faculty across this country. There are people who have PhDs, who have masters, who are working at two, three different universities trying to put together, you know, enough money to be able to live and are still living in their car, especially if they live in expensive cities. I know there are people that live in like, um, that are teaching in like the San Francisco area, which is the most expensive city to live in, in the United States. And they're living in their cars and they're fully employed. Not full-time employed, but fully employed as in like, I teach at this university on Mondays and Wednesdays and Fridays and this university at Tuesdays and Thursdays. And I also teach night classes and online classes and are doing all this work, um, you know, contributing to the education of people of, of people in this country uh, and our education system and then living in their cars. And so I can definitely point that out as I, I just listed more than three positive things but that is a good way to kind of like help yourself push through that fear conquer your fears number five last one fear surrender and feel the fear <laughs> so they say many of us allow fear to paralyze us because we don't like feeling fear but if you simply allow yourself to feel the fear when it shows up you will notice that it quickly dissipates and suddenly the fear feels more manageable So the next time you notice yourself getting stressed out or feeling afraid of something not working out, sit quietly or by yourself, set your timer for two minutes and start taking deep breaths and review everything that you have accomplished that day. That's what I added on. Okay. Take a deep breath, sit down, write it down, journal, take a walk and think about all the things that you have accomplished that day, all the things you have accomplished in life, because there are plenty of things that we don't accomplish in a day that that escape us, but um, we shouldn't be focusing on those things. We should be focusing on the things that we have accomplished and then the things that we didn't accomplish, um, you know, figuring out how to get them accomplished. Maybe not that day, but you know, in the near future, the next day, I didn't do this. I mean, I'm literally working off a list on my passion planner from something that I wrote two or three weeks ago. 
I think it's three weeks ago. Three weeks ago when I went to the conference, I had all these things I needed to get done. I didn't get them done. I'm doing them now. I am so behind, but I'm getting them done. And I'm feeling great about the fact that I'm getting them done. Maybe not in the time frame of the week that I said I was going to, but I'm getting them done. I had a whole project about um, sorting through all the bedding in the house. And I was talking about it since the fucking summer. I swear to God. Finally got it done yesterday. It took me all day, but I got it done. Got a whole bunch of beds, bedding in the back of my car that I need to get to Goodwill, but it's in there. It took me a long time, but I got it done. Got it done. Didn't happen two months ago. It happened yesterday, but it's done. That's, that's the thing to focus on. So really being able to understand that fear is just a feeling. It's, it's, it's natural. It's a feeling. Deal with it. Sit down. Think about what you've accomplished and it will, it will start to subside because everyone experiences fear. No one can be fearless. That whole like, if you ever watch that, um, if you ever watch that awful movie, from Will Smith when during his downfall, like he he hasn't put out a good movie since since I don't know when, um, but one of his shitty movies, which is After Earth, that he did with Jaden, because he wanted to make Jaden a movie star and Jaden can't act, or is not interested in acting. Let me not just say that. But in that movie, they kept talking about like fear, fear is a is a is a concept, like and the whole idea was that for them to defeat this these uh these alien creatures, is that they had to actually be a like void of fear they had to actually get to be fearless to, to be able to be able to defeat these monsters and that is a really bad like message to put out there because it really is not about being fearless it's about dealing with that fear how do you deal with that fear like understanding that the fear is there there is no such thing as being fearless like you're all the fear is always there you just you just learn how to deal with that fear. You focus on something else. I jumped out of a fucking plane, okay? I was scared to death. I'm, a, I'm scared of heights, period, for various reasons. Like, I've fallen off things that were high as a child. Like, I'm surprised I'm still alive. And I haven't had any broken bones in my life. Surprising, because I've, I've fallen off a lot of things. And I, I, I jumped out of a plane. I was scared. I was scared, I was scared shitless. But you know what I did? focus on the fact that there was a white man attached to the back of me not just the fact that he's a white man but just a man. oh man there was somebody else attached to me so I was like if I'm gonna die I'm gonna die I'm not down alone <laughs> one two I ain't gotta do nothing he's doing all the work I don't have to be afraid that I'll forget to do something they told me to do he's right there doing it I don't gotta pull nothing I don't gotta do nothing but just you know um you know make sure that my my body uh relaxes and doesn't hit this man while he's trying to do was going to save our lives and then focusing on the view because it was beautiful. It was a beautiful view. Uh, I was scared the whole time, but I was still focusing on a beautiful view. And I was like, you know what? This is, this is amazing. This is something that I can say that I, I can tell my kids about my grandkids about that. I did something, but I wasn't fearless. Fearless is not what it is. What makes us, what makes us kind of being able to deal with fear is not the fact that we don't experience fear, but is that we're confident that we can deal with the consequences of our actions. Like we know what we can do with it. We know what will happen to us. Like I said, I jumped out that, that plane and I was like, well, at least I'm not going to die alone because this man will die with me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he will die with me. <laughs> and it won't be my fault. <laughs> but, um, that's what we have to really think about. We have to be confident that we can deal with the consequences of our actions. You can dig yourself out of the hole, that you can get it done. And that is how we become people that know how to push through fear and move forward to keep going, to achieve our goals. And with that, I'm done with this topic. All right, so last part. Last part is figure this out. So this is real short, and this is just me trying to figure shit out. So I, on top of all these fear and all this other stuff I've been dealing with, <laughs> all the stuff I've been dealing with, I, um, if you follow me or you know me, whatever, I have been trying so dearly to continue to use natural deodorant. I'm trying to be more natural in life, just be healthier. And, um, I've been having like what seems like an allergic reaction. Maybe it's my eczema. I have, I have had eczema since I was a child. Um, and so I have sensitive dry skin in patches and, um, natural deodorant has just been like, it's been quite a fight. Like, I don't understand. Like, figure this out for me. Figure this out for me. Why is it that things that are natural take so much fucking time and effort and knowledge to get done? Like, my gosh, I just, the amount of products that I had to buy recently 
because I've, I've been using natural deodorant for like at least two years now. I've switched when things didn't work out. Like the last one that I used, like I used, I tried like a lot of them. They just wasn't working for me because I felt like I was still stinky. But then I was doing some research and I found out that that's a part of the detox pro- process. And that maybe I needed to start doing scrubs, like armpit scrubs and using detoxing oil. And I was like, what the fuck? This is so much work. So much work. I was just looking at um, Black and Green, <laughs> the the website. And they have like a starter kit or something so you can figure out like how to go natural. And it includes a scrub and oil and different um, different uh, natural deodorants with different bases. And I was like, look at this shit. Like, look, look at how much products it goes into being able to go natural, how much information you need to to have. And I'm like, why is it like, why is it so much work? Why is it so much work? It's been so bad that I actually went back to the deodorants with the aluminum in them. So that I wouldn't have, an, I know I wouldn't have an allergic reaction to that because I need to not be funky. I need to have my armpits dry, but I, and I need my skin to like go back to a healthy natural state. And then I can start the pro I have to start the process all over again. And all I'm thinking of is why is this shit so hard? Why is it so hard? Why is it so hard? Why does it come with so many complications and products? And items you need to buy and steps. Why do I have to do a, a armpit scrub once or twice a week to to help the, the skin around my, my armpits and help with the detoxing process? Why do I have to put an oil underneath my armpits to help it deal with the detoxification? Why do I have to shop around to see if it's charcoal paste or arrow arrow root or um, coconut oil? or whatever it works with my with my underarms to keep me smelling fresh um and and dry under my arms or not dry why does it take so much work why does it take so much work let me know if you know and if you know a good natural deodorant let me know um because i'm about to go buy this 45 dollar kit from black and green um that has these different deodorants to see if I could find one that works for me. Like I haven't spent so much money and, and time researching deodorants in my life. It was just like, go to the store. Okay. Let me pick up the degree or the secret or the dove. <laughs> now it's like, let me look into the ingredients. Let me see what this is. Like, do I want paste or do I want to roll or do I want to stick like all kinds? Like, it's just too much. It's too much, but I'm, I'm going to continue. I'm going to persevere. I'm going to find it. I told you desired outcome. I'm going to be natural. I just have to refocus and, and realign my goals and my thoughts on this. I have not failed the natural deodorant project. I have not, not, I just had to take a detour, take a step back, reevaluate, heal, and then move forward (laughs) okay and with that i am done i hope you guys stuck through that was a long one it was a lot but i I hope it was helpful i hope that you were able to get something from it um again thank you thank you thank you very much to those who reached out to me when i put out the post about you know my fear of failure and how i was how i was trying to push through i really do appreciate your support and your words um I, i really really do and if you really love me you can support me even more by going over to um itunes or apple Podcasts and leave me a review if you don't know how to do so i posted it i posted a, t- a quick tutorial on my website figureoutyourlifeblog.com where you can figure out how to leave me a review because that would really help me that would help me feel like less of a failure <laughs> that would help me deal with my fear of failure if you go and help me get to 50 reviews by the end of the year i will put it in the show notes to the link to how to do a tutorial if you've already given me a review or a rating thank you thank you thank you very much but tell others please share this podcast with others anyone that you think that might uh, gain something from it talk about it share it reshot it you know shout you know shout me out somewhere um and let me know uh other topics that you'd like me to cover and um you know subscribe wherever you're listening to this if it's spotify if it's soundcloud if it's Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, wherever. Just make sure you're subscribed so you never miss out on when the podcast drops. 
Also, um, if you want to keep up to date with things that are going on with me and other things that I have figured out and I'm sharing with people, please go over to my website, figureoutyourlifeblog.com and sign up for the newsletter. Um, with that, I'm absolutely done. I hope you guys have a great week. I hope you're blessed. I hope you have a wonderful morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Stay blessed, stay healthy, stay hydrated, stay out of people's hymens and vaginas. And I will talk to you guys next week. Bye-bye.